How's it going? And welcome to episode 108 of On The Wire. Proud member of the Pitcher List Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. You can follow me at 80 Grid. That's all spelled out. And you can follow Kevin Hastings at Hastings Kevin, who is back with me once again. Kevin, so glad to have you back. Draft season is over for some, myself included. No, I have a supplemental draft on Sunday evening in a home dynasty league, but I think my full drafts, and we talked about this on Bench with Bubba, like the possibility of jumping in another draft is still there. I get it. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I think I'm done. I'm ready just to jump into fab, but I'm glad, I'm glad you're back with me. Miss you for the last couple of weeks. How's it been? How's everything going? Oh, it's going great. Just uh, extremely busy with a new job and my wife traveling for hers and but it's absolutely amazing to be back here and yeah, trying to get ready for fab for this weekend at the same time, deciding on, am I done? Yeah. Right. And the more I think about it, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to do something after the weekend, but prior to the season starting on Thursday, four days as this episode comes out here on Sunday morning, we have four days till 2023 opening day, favorite time of the year. Yeah, that's true. I, the weekend, I know I'm not drafting this weekend. I'm going to focus on my home, my dynasty league for Sunday night, and that's it. But it's going to be difficult to stay out of something Monday through Wednesday, possibly even Thursday. It's, I haven't done an online championship in three or four years. When I first started hopping in to NFBC, I did an OC back at the time, mm-hmm. but I've done mostly 15 team leagues. But I've drafted six of our (laughs) on the wire listener leagues. And so I'm thinking Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, right before the season starts hopping in an OC. I think if it's still open, our friend Yancey Eaton is in one of those on Wednesday. And it's like the unofficial, just because Yancey's in the room, it is the unofficial beat Yancey Eaton OC. Absolutely. So there, that would be the target. I think it's a, I think it's the 8 p.m. one, which it's just like that worst cutoff. Like all these times for me, the worst, like 8 p.m. I can't, it's like the kids aren't in bed yet. It's like, it's hard to get away. But then the next one isn't until 10 or 11 p.m. And I'm like, Do I really want to be up drafting until three o'clock in the morning? I'm not sure about that. So I know obviously those are directed at West Coast and yourself in Hawaii, but maybe a midday (laughs) one, if I'm lucky, that would be the one I might target. I just, it's been, I've been done drafting for a week or so now. I don't know if I can make it another week (laughs) before the season starts without hopping in another one. Cross your fingers. NFBC does the second chance leagues again around Memorial Day. So they didn't do them last year. Maybe they bring them back this year. We'll see. But we have fab. We have fab. It's amazing. We don't have to worry about drafting on Sunday. Let's worry about the post draft, basically, with fab. And it is upon us. We're going to be running our episodes throughout the course of the regular season, the same way we did last year, going category by category, recording. We are recording this one on Friday evening, but we will be recording throughout the season on Saturday nights whenever humanly possible so that we get the most up-to-date information for your fab betting on Sunday afternoon and into the evening. So we're getting back into the swing of things here and we're getting into some player recommendations for each of the Roto categories, typically basing the availability of those roster ship numbers on the NFBC main event and TGFBI to represent 15 teamers. And then, of course, the NFBC online championship and our own 10 listener leagues that represent 12 teamers. They are set up the same way. We'll typically sprinkle in overall roster ship numbers from Yahoo and maybe CBS and ESPN and what have you to put things in perspective for those types of leagues as well. To kick the season off with us, we brought in our friend Brett Ford. Brett is going to be taking over the weekly fab recommendation article over at Pitcher List for the 2023 season as well. But again, new voice in there for those recommendations, which we'll surely be shouting out as a companion piece to our episodes throughout the course of the year. So make sure that you're checking that out on a regular basis. And it makes sense for have him join us for the first fab run of the year to break down his process and strategy when it comes to fab and playing fantasy baseball as a whole. But it gets it gives us a sneak peek at some of his recommendations for week one as well, which is arguably the most exciting fab 
bad period, especially for those of us who were drafting back in November. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I don't have to draft again. I got a new draft already set with Fab. I just have to spend some of my Fab money on it. But we'll get into all of that in just a little bit. First and foremost, Brett, thank you, man, for joining us for the first Fab run of 2023. How's it going? Oh, uh, man, it's great. Uh, it's been a long off season. I'm super excited to hit the ground running. This is my first year with Pitcher List and taking over for Kevin on the Fab Insights is a huge honor for me. So super excited to to hit the ground running this Sunday. I know you said you guys are pretty much done with drafts. I've got three home leagues left to go. So I'm kind of scrambling, <laughs> trying to compartmentalize a little bit with these three drafts, two on Sunday and then one on Wednesday night before opening day. It'll be a busy Sunday for me as I scramble to, to publish Fab Insights on Pitcher List. And then <laughs> then I got to turn around and trap two teams that day. Very excited though. That's what I live for. And I'm pumped to be on the podcast as well. Thanks for inviting yeah. me. Luckily, especially as a staffer here at Pitcher List, you've got three drafts going. You can utilize all the stuff at PL Pro, the auction calculator, if you're doing auction or just to get valuations in general. And then the draft guide or the draft tool. Kevin, you said you were talking about it on Venture Bubble. Did you end up using I don't know if that passed or not, or if you your keeper draft, did you end up using it for that? Oh, I am using it for that. It's a weird situation. It's a home league draft, keeper league, and I not only can I not be present for the draft, I'm not even available during the draft. So I have a proxy doing the draft for me. And that made it so easy to just print out the values and say, here's what, go with this. This is what we want to do. Of course, a couple other tips I threw in there of what I would do if, if things go right. But for the most part, I'm just turning him loose. Yeah, go grab what you think is going to make this team the best that you can with these values. And yeah, it made it really easy to do that. Yeah, it's as good as any tool that you've used elsewhere. And what's nice is that it has two sets of projections that you can you can you're provided with both yep, the PLV, both. <laughs> the PLV, and the ATC, which is regularly referenced on this show and many others, just because of the aggregation that it puts forth. Guys, we got a lot to talk about, so let's let's get past the little semi promo of PL Pro here that I wanted to make sure I got in there because it's totally worth it and you should be doing that. But besides that. Let's get, we got a lot of news to go to. So I am going to go back and forth between you guys. Of course, as always, if you want to chime in on what the news item that I sent to the other one, please do. Otherwise, we're going to, we're going to plow through here. We're going to start off with some demotions and get, unfortunately, we're going to end everything with a whole lot of injury news. So let's start with the less negative thing first. A lot of stuff happened earlier in the week. We're going to get to it because we haven't talked about it yet. And this is first and foremost, Atlanta. They sent down the presumed new shortstop, Vaughn Grissom. They also sent down Braden Shoemake, putting Orlando Arcia in the driver's seat at shortstop, the sh- starting shortstop for the Atlanta Braves on opening day. Kevin, in your opinion, what's more likely? Does Arcia play himself out of the job, forcing the Braves to call Grissom back up? Or is there an injury that forces Grissom to come back up? Or is Grissom just down for a long time because he didn't sign a long-term contract like all the other guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you phrase the question, the most likely of those options is see that another injury will need to happen. But I don't think Arcia is going to play him, play his way out of this. Grissom's got to play his way in. They know what they're getting with Arcia. Right, They had him in the lineup when Albies was hurt last season for a while. They had him in, out there for quite a bit. This is probably a lot to do with how they feel the defense is being played at the shortstop position. And it, it means our seat is going to be in there for at least the foreseeable future, in my opinion, until Grissom forces the issue or other things happening on the diamond, including injuries and guys got to move around and Grissom then has a slot again. I think this is what the Braves feel. This isn't a rebuilding team. This isn't a team. There's, I don't think there's any time manipulation going on here. I think this is what the Braves believe leads them to the most wins. So this is the way they're, that they're going to roll with that for a while. And I think Arcia would have to do a whole lot to play his way out of this. I think he, they believe this is the way it's going to win. So when we're searching for plate appearances, 
my my whole the plate appearances and innings pitched is overblown a little bit. I was talking drafts. Once we get in season, that is what we're trying to maximize. Highest quality as possible as we're getting them in there. We could do worse than having a part of the Atlanta lineup. Arcia is definitely in play in Fab this weekend because he probably wasn't drafted in a whole lot of places. No, of course not. Eddie Eddie Rosario, we'll touch on it in just briefly later, but he, he was reported as having a little bit of an injury concern today as we're recording on Friday. Sam Hilliard talk- season. There it is. <laughs> I was going to say, there is the possibility that Grissom was talked about playing some outfield last year at the end of last year as well, just to get keep him in the lineup. So there's that. But yes, Sam Hilliard is there to kill that season. I know, that you're, I know you're still holding on to that one. We'll see how that works out there. And uh, we got to remember, Orlando Garcia in 2016, if you go back, fun, you can go on Pipeline, MLB Pipeline, and you can see all the past, or at least a lot of the past, top 100 prospects list. He was the sixth rated prospect in 2016. Yeah, that was 2016. It was like seven years ago. I get it. <laughs> but he was still in the same conversation as like Corey Seager and others that were in that group. So Lucas Gilito was on that list as well, on the top, like, top six or seven. Do you see a situation here that you kind of strikes your eye, Brett? Yeah, I mean, he's not to spoil my Fab Insights article on Pitcher List for Sunday, but he's one of the guys that I, I have mentioned in in there as an infielder that I'm interested in. I think people forget about Arcia. Like you said, he was a top prospect. He's only 28 years old. He feels like a boring veteran that's just been around for a while. He's only 28. He's going to be batting probably eighth or ninth in that Braves lineup in front of Acuna, in front of Albies, Olsen, setting the table for those guys. I think he's great for runs and he's got some pop too. He showed that with nine home runs in just under 250 plate appearances last year. He can be a guy that if he gets 500 plate appearances, hits 10 to 15 home runs. What's really fun about Arcia is in Yahoo, he is not only shortstop eligible, but also eligible at first base, which is a really strange combination. (laughs) Yes, it is. All right. I only wanted to throw that out there for the segue. Now I'm ruining the segue by mentioning it. But Brett, first base option in Milwaukee, Keston Hira is out. He, him and Tyler Naquin are not making the Brewers opening day roster. Hira does not have any options left. I haven't seen an official announcement yet, but I would assume that means he's going to be DFA'd. Does this impact Milwaukee's lineup at all, in your opinion? Or was Hira not even a, not even a consideration for you getting any actual playing time there. And the flip side of that, do either one of these guys here specifically, really, do they latch on anywhere else like to get meaningful at-bats? Here and Naquin were both pretty much universally undrafted. So I don't think either of them being jettisoned off the Brewers roster will affect anybody, but maybe NL only formats. As far as latching on somewhere else, I think... Hira has a chance at maybe catching on with the Phillies after the Hoskins injury. I know we'll talk a little bit about that later, but losing that big right-handed bat in their lineup, the Phillies could be looking for a platoon option with Derek Hall at first base. And frankly, I thought it was potentially going to be Luke Voigt that the Brewers would cut, which would have made sense in Philadelphia. But Hira fits that mold as well, and he could get some at-bats there. Naquin, I think, is actually one of those guys that could catch on just about anywhere as a quality fourth or fifth outfielder. We saw him pop in Cincinnati a couple years ago. So you know that the bat is still there. It's just who gets hurt and who needs a spot filled in their outfield. I think Naquin is one of those guys that just fits in pretty much anywhere. Naquin was like that guy, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but he went off for like a week and everybody was spending triple digits for him. And it was amusing. It was funny because it's, yeah, you have to put in a bid because he's doing what he's doing, but like, it, why are you expecting? It? it was just one of, I think, Kevin, I think you and I were talking about like, yeah, this was a classic, this was a classic situation where Kevin says, I'll probably put in bids for him, but I probably won't get him. <laughs> and yeah. I don't think he got him anywhere, which was obviously good because it didn't continue. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see where Naquin goes. I honestly, I did not even consider here going to Philadelphia because I think I'm very much so excited about Derek Hall getting regular playing time at first base. I'm hoping something like that doesn't happen. We'll talk about that in a little bit, like you said. All right, let's go. Let's talk some pitching, Kevin. We got some send downs in Los Angeles. The Dodgers, they reassigned 
not only Gavin Stone, but also Michael Grove. And on top of that, in their rotation, Noah Syndergaard, he'd been dealing apparently with uh, some mini blisters on his, in his last start. It didn't stop him from actually throwing the ball, but it stopped him from producing anything substantial. Do any of these, do these things combined, especially the send downs of Grove and Stone, have you more interested in Ryan Pepio, who looks to be have clinched that number five spot in the rotation for the Dodgers? Or is there somebody else that you're a little bit more focused on? No, I think it's probably PPO. I, I don't know how much interest I have. He is a Dodgers pitcher. They do well at this. So we should at least take a look. I do want to shout out Russell Withers, armchair Roto who months ago told you and I that his Spencer Strider for this season was Gavin Stone. Now, over the past recent weeks, I've been hearing that a lot in a lot of places. But uh, Russell told us that months ago, and he was on Strider last season, even in draft season. I was like in October. Before people were picking (laughs) him up. Yeah, that that's something I just wanted to give him a shout out. He's been on that all off season, and it seems like that's the prevailing thought now is if there is a 2023 Spencer Strider it could be Gavin Stone and it very well could still be I think PPO is the guy here he probably gets the Rockies in LA in in his first start I'd be a little bit I think I brought this up earlier in the offseason be careful this won't be actual Rocky Road per se as they will have been in Colorado for one day after being in Arizona for six weeks and then heading back to LA. So they may be a little better at picking up the movement on the balls, on the pitches than they typically are for Rocky road performances. But yeah, if you're trying to maximize what you're doing with innings and PPOs available, no, he's, he's going to get an early week start in the first full week of the season. He's probably worth a shot. Yeah, I guess it depends on where he I didn't I haven't seen the full breakdown of when their starters are going, but if he gets one of those first three or four first three or four sparts and the Dodgers do have four games in that first four days of the season, so before lineups switch over, there are there's plenty of opportunities. So unless he is literally that fifth starter, which we know just because you're the fifth starter doesn't mean you go the fifth day. I mean, he's the fifth and he would get the Rockies because the Rockies actually start in San Diego. Okay. That means obviously he wouldn't start until the following week. You wouldn't get anything out of him in the the first four days of the right. NFBC season, at least. And especially in those weekly leagues where you're switching over those rosters or those rotations on Monday. All right, let's go over to the Phillies. We're not going to talk about what we talked about earlier, but an announcement that I thought was interesting, Brett, was Dave Dombrowski. He said that the Phillies were not going to be placing Bryce Harper on the 60-day IL. It it provided all of us who want to see Bryce Harper playing earlier a glimmer of hope that he could be back on the active roster by, say, like the end of May, which is a far cry from the expected post-All-Star break return that I think we had all planned for and probably still should be planning for. But the fact that he's not on that 60-day does keep the door open to a possibility. What does this possibility of return do for you regarding stashing somebody like Harper, especially in a league with limited or no IL spots available? Sure, yeah. I think having 110 games of Bryce Harper is obviously so much better than having just 80 games of him. It makes him much more palatable as a bench stash, even in those leagues that you're struggling to to lose a bench spot with somebody that that is on the injured list. Last year, he played he played pretty much through this injury all of last year, not all of last year, but like from late May on, he played through this injury and he was he still played like an, an outstanding the outstanding outfielder that he is of course he dh the entire time because it was his elbow but he i mean he slashed what like 285 his numbers were incredible the second half of the season and we all saw what he did in the postseason post season as well so he's definitely something or somebody that i'm interested in stashing as a fantasy manager regardless of my il situation there's no better bat in baseball to stash right now in my opinion, unless one of these prospects, even even the prospects that, that you're looking at a May call up, he's still a better stash than any of those, in my opinion, especially if he gets those 110 games that we're talking about coming back a little bit early. Yeah, I have one league where I'm exposed to Bruce Harper and it's in the PL staff league. 
where there are three IL spots. And honestly, that's the only direction I'm going with Bryce Harper right now. He's got an ADP of 225 in the main event, which had 10 drafts or 12 drafts happen in the last week or so. Obviously, a whole lot more by the time you're listening to this, as most of the Vegas ones are happening this weekend. I'm still personally can't do it. Even with this glimmer of hope, I get it. I think they're just keeping that flexibility that, which honestly... I think is the wrong move on the Phillies part because it like obviously opens up a 60 man. It opens up a spot on the 40 man rotation on the 40 man roster. Maybe they don't want to put somebody on the 40 man roster. Maybe they don't want to say the start someone's clock in that way. I don't know. Kevin, not on top of that, Bryce Harper, UT only in NFBC. I think he's outfield eligible in Yahoo still, but that obviously plays that has a wrinkle in it as well. Is Harper somebody, if you do a draft this week, is this is Harper? I know you can only have so many stash spots in an NFBC. Is Harper the stash you want to make here? or is it, You need the more flexibility. Possibly. Possibly. He was going in about the spot where I would start considering it. And I finally pulled the trigger once, I think, in the 190s somewhere in, in one of our 12-team listener leagues. I pulled the trigger on it one time. The range here is really wide. In those 12 main events, a min of 174, a max of 292. Now that's 20th round of a 15 team league. If he's still there, yeah, I'll take a shot and I'll just go in knowing this is my one stash. I have six bench spots for the first two months of the season, not seven, and hope there aren't any setbacks. And then the tough part comes when there is a setback. Yeah, just forget about it. Let him go. It was worth a shot. It was a 20th rounder. But uh, yeah, I gave it a shot in the 190s of a 12-team league just once. But I, that's about where. But it's got to be your only one. You can't take him and Altuve pro- and a couple of prospects and Jacob deGrom. And it, if you're going to do it, it's your one stash because it, there is no chance you're going to see him until the very end of when this 60 day IL stint would end towards the end of May. Harper's the type of stash that you, if you don't draft him, you watch. This is why we always say check your drops every fab. Somebody period. might get that. Most people that are going to avoid it, that at all costs, they're going to hang on for the long haul. But yes, absolutely. Some, I was or, thinking that as well, but I knew you'd bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> also consider in that league, Kevin, that you drafted him, like you, you can drop him. Like you can drop him because you know what? You can bid on him too. If you feel like you have a little bit of flexibility in your fab, especially in like month two, like when you hit into like mid May and you're like, I need a little bit of flexibility, even for just one week, I'll drop him now. Hopefully I got the budget to bring him back in. But yeah, of course, the longer you wait to drop him, the more he's going to cost because people know that they're not going to have to stash him that much longer than you already did. All right. That is an injury kind of talk. We got a lot of injuries to dive into, and we are going to get into a lot of those in just a little bit, but we do have to take our first break. All right, Kevin, we got a whole bunch of random injuries that have been happening all throughout the week. And yes, we get this throughout spring training as well. I'm just going to go through a bunch of these bullet point by bullet point and get your take on them as a whole really. But uh, we've got Yon Mankata. He was diagnosed with a concussion during the World Baseball Classic. Nolan Arenado was dealing with a hand injury from there as well. Elo Jimenez was dealing with the right calf cramping earlier in the week. Xander Bogarts was wearing a splint on his left wrist, saying that this is a very common spring training issue for him. Who knows? Like I said before, Eddie Rosario, he was scratched from his start late in the week with lower back tightness. Jared Kalanick was dealing with quad tightness. John Duran, who I believe returned Turned today, but he was he was hit with a liner in the leg earlier in the week. Austin Nola got hit in the face with a pitch earlier in the week. We got a whole bunch of random injuries that kind of that might be minor, they might be random. Who knows? Do any of these injuries have catch your attention, or is it just part of spring training and should be ignored? And you have to focus your attention on the major ones, which we have plenty of to talk about. I think for the most part, I'm glossing over them uh none of these are too worrisome to me at this point however it's definitely something to keep an eye on and the one you did not mention here that you did have in the rundown is one he's already taken dry swings after having some oblique issues 
definitely not that bad. He's already taken dry swings again. That's probably the most concerning to me. One, he costs the most. And two, yeah, he's already taken dry swings. So maybe it wasn't anything to begin with, but obliques scare us, especially <laughs> for these guys and because they can pop back up. You can re that it's something that can be re injured with. Alberto Mondesi a couple years back he injured the oblique on the opposite side probably because he was compensating for the one that he was supposedly back healthy from this is the one that I'm concerned about and I haven't drafted Juan Soto anyway he's just where he goes in the first round I'm more interested in other players but I even if I was someone that had been drafting Juan Soto and I was drafting this weekend I don't think I'm taking him mid first round where we've been seeing him go. That's probably the one most concerning to me. Yeah, I think another one, Kyle Tucker was dealing with an ankle thing, but he got back into games as well. Yep. And Jordan Alvarez was expected to be back in the games as well. There's yeah, just most a lot of these of we have seen back in action. Yep. So I'm not too worried. And it's probably if it was August or September, they may or may not have even taken a day off. Exactly. I think that's what Carlos Rodon said earlier as well, but it looks like he'll be early May as a return. It was the last return, I, the last note I saw on him. We're not going to talk about that specifically, but it's just, there's a lot of noise. But we said, we talk about that with production. We talked about that with stats, a lot of noise and all that. There could be a lot of noise in players just ramping them, ramping up their bodies for April as well. As long as these guys are getting back into the literal swing of things, as you mentioned with the Juan Soto, maybe it's not something we concerned about, but, yeah, of course. The dreaded oblique word is the dreaded O word is not something <laughs> we want to be hearing, especially for our first rounders. All right, Brett, one injury that is a bit more serious than all of these included Jose Altuve breaking his right thumb during the World Baseball Classic it required surgery, which he has already gotten. It should keep him sidelined for at least the first two months of the season. I think the report I saw was that he will resume baseball activities after eight to 10 weeks. So we'll see when he actually gets back into games. First off, starting for Houston as a whole, who's filling in at the Keystone for the Astros? And second part of this is for those who paid up for Altuve prior to this injury, probably in their anywhere between the second and fourth round of their draft for that second base, which was already tight, who should they be looking at to fill the Keystone or at least their middle infield spot if they happen to have a backup? Sure. Yeah. It's funny the way you juxtapose those, those two questions because the guys that are potentially replacing Altuve in Houston are not second base eligible in the <laughs> NFBC. So David Hensley had a cup of coffee with the Astros last year. He is going to be the starting second baseman in Houston for the most part. Obviously, Mauricio Dubon, who the Astros acquired from the Giants last year, is there, but he's had a dud of a spring while Hensley is tearing things up. Hensley batted 298 with 10 home runs and 20 stolen bases in just over 450 plate appearances last year. He had a WRC plus of 130. Now, granted, that's at AAA. The bats play up in that league, but at 6'6", 190, he's a guy that, you know, even though he is UT eligible only right now in those leagues, who I might be looking at as a long-term fill-in for Altuve. Um in the short term, there's a handful of guys that are really interesting, starting with Michael Massey, who is a rookie. He's the projected starter at second base in Kansas City. And then slightly less interesting as the old grizzled veteran, Jonathan Scope. He should be hitting in the middle of the Detroit lineup, and everybody knows that he's good for about one week every season where he just absolutely pops off. So maybe it'll be scoping day. Who knows? And then you have Rodolfo Castro with the Pirates. They open the season in Cincinnati. If he gets the start, he could be an interesting option. And then one guy who maybe in deeper leagues or as a speculative ad on your roster, who was absolutely fantastic in the World Baseball Classic for Team Canada is Edouard Julien. That's French-Canadian pronunciation. I'm sure I butchered that. But he had really good numbers at AA for the Twins last year. And uh, he could be one of those guys that they pull up based on his performance in the World Baseball Classic, he led the entire tournament in OPS, a name to watch for sure, especially in deeper leagues. Yeah, not to mention, we'll get to it in a little bit with Corey Polanco expected to start the season on the IL. There 
very well could be an opening in Minnesota. Whether or not he gets the call up, he, I believe he's already been sent down during spring training as well. Came back from WC and said, they're like, eh, no, you can hit, go down to AAA. But who's to say that they might have a need for that as well? I do want to give you extra props for scoping day. That was, that was played there, sir. And I want to make sure I go on record for that. All right, let's uh, let's move to the backstop, Kevin. We got some, I think, pretty surprising news here. I was just giving a buddy of mine, my home league, a hard time because I roster three catchers in that league. One of them is like minor league protected. It's Adley Rutschman. I haven't called them up yet, so I'm playing time manipulation with him. But I've got Sal Perez and MJ Melendez on that roster. So he's, are you really going to run with three catchers? I'm like, are you really going to run with a half a catcher and Gabriel Moreno? And then I texted him back as soon as I heard the news about Carson Kelly fracturing his forearm. And I told him, I take it all back. <laughs> you at least have a full catcher now. But what is your take on uh, Gabriel Moreno's stock in Arizona, assuming he's going to be getting close to full-time playing time, if not 100% playing time behind the plate in Arizona? Yeah, I think he's going to get the majority of it for sure and that's gonna bump up his plate appearances it does not appear that has happened on the projection systems at least those on that are publicly available on fan graphs as of yet he's still in that 370 380 plate appearance range which i would think this would bump him up in that 450 range that we see from the guys that get a majority of the starts behind the plate for their teams that gets his projections to right at double digit home runs, which is really nice. Typically we like a few more home runs from a catcher, but typically we aren't getting a guy that can put the bat on the ball like Moreno can. So he's projected as a rookie for 275 batting average. And we know projections on batting average are typically very conservative, especially for prospects and rookies. So we could be looking at even a higher batting average with 50 or so runs and RBI double digit home runs. And he does steal some bases. He had seven of them at triple a last year. This is going to be a guy that if he's available, he's going to be on a lot of waiver wire target lists for this weekend. I know that it really ummed me out when the trade happened because I had Carson. I had literally just drafted Carson Kelly in a in a gladiator league. I'm like, oh, that's really going to cut into his playing time. L- little did I know, <laughs> uh, had nothing to do with what was going to cut into his playing time. So maybe, maybe the blessing. Maybe I just don't take the negative stats <laughs> at that position. Luckily, literally everybody who drafted even one gladiator is dealing with multiple issues in their lineup, I'm sure. All right, go back to pitching. We'll go to Houston here. Hunter Brown, he was scratched from his spring training start earlier this week for supposed precautionary reasons, reportedly dealing with the lower back tightness of his own. Do you have any concerns with Brown going into the season with this precautionary pulling of his start? And if he does miss any time, who do the Astros actually have to plug in to that fifth rotation spot? I'm not sure if I'm concerned about Hunter Brown in relation to this particular injury. I've been off Hunter Brown this offseason just because of... I'm just worried that the Astros are going to handle him with kid gloves. There's going to be a workload limitation. They're, they've only allowed him 100 innings in 2021, 120 in 2022. And I'm not convinced that they'll let let him throw 140 in 2023. If he gets there, great. But there's a lot of people being drafted around him that I'm more interested in as far as pitching goes. In leagues like a best ball or anything like that, his per start stats are probably going to be awesome. He, in his last two spring training starts, he combined for seven innings, just three hits, one earned run, and seven strikeouts. His slider, he throws it super hard. He's almost DeGrom-ish. He's throwing it in the mid-90s, and he's got a really good fastball to go with it. So he's a guy that that I'm interested in like best ball leagues, but not in season long so much. Then uh, as far as who replaces him in the rotation, unfortunately for the Astros, they've had a string of injuries in their starting pitching ranks. So we've seen some guys like Brandon Belak make spot starts for them. There's also Ronel Blanco, who is in their pen right now as the long man, projected to be the long man out of their pen. So he could maybe make a spot start if they go with a bullpen day. And then, of course, there's 
the infamous Forrest Whitley, who has been sitting in the miners forever, rotting away and really ticking off his dynasty owners, I'm sure, but or dynasty managers, rather. He's sitting there and waiting. It'll be interesting to see if he gets the shot here because McCullers is still on the IL as well. Astros will be looking for that start of the spot starter, or at least for a couple times through the rotation. My best bet probably be Brandon Belak, but we'll see how they play it out. Got to give the ghost of Forrest Whitley like some kind of opportunity here, right? Oh man. Yeah. My, I go back to my home league again, my dynasty league, and we have rules about when you draft minor leaguers, you have four years to call them up. And if you don't, they just become free agents and Forrest Whitley is hit that <laughs> unfortunately. So it'd be really funny if he actually got some opportunity and somebody else was able to pick him up rather than the team that drafted him. Yeah. Um, for his sake, I hope so. He's, right? he's, he's been, I have to assume he's been grinding away in the minors. He's not just sitting there and resting on his signing bonus. So we'll see what happens. All right. Let's get to that injury. We keep, we kept alluding to multiple times in, in other notes here, Kevin, and that is Reese Hoskins. He tears his ACL on was basically a routine grounder uh, or taking grounders on the grass. He requires surgery. He's going to get it. Obviously he's going to be out for a long time. If not the entire season, who is getting those reps at first base and why is it, why should we be excited about Derek Hall? Yeah, I was already excited about yep. <laughs> Derek Hall. I was even drafting him in 12-team leagues, and that's not the case in a lot of 12-teamers out there. But this, for him, he's going to play versus righties for sure. Maybe he plays against some lefties now as well, but the big thing for him is he's UT only now, and he won't be in a couple of weeks. He's probably going to get that first base eligibility. So then we're probably looking at, it looks like at least roster resource, they have Schwarber moving to DH and then bringing an outfielder into the lineup. That's one possibility. And well, there's, that's the case that we're looking at Jake Cave getting some playing time, or there's some talk of Alec Bohm could play first base. That, they have Josh Harrison on the roster. He can play third. There, there's a lot of different ways this could go. But I think as far as real fantasy relevance right now, especially 12 teamers and less and even mixed 15s, I think we're looking at Derek Hall getting first base eligibility is the big news out of this. Yeah, I got to assume that happens pretty quickly. You need 10 games in season to get that eligibility. So I would assume by week three, he'll have it. So you'll have that little bit of flexibility. I think you can live with Derek Hall's power in your UT spot <laughs> for the first two, three weeks of the season. Um, Absolutely. For sure. there, there, is, there, there is a post-hype guy as a non-roster invitee that is down at AAA, and this may change whether there's usually a date. If they're not signed by, they can opt out on these non-roster contracts. Scott Kingery sitting there as a non-roster guy at AAA. This could give him another opportunity. Didn't he have the 10-year contract? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like he's and it seems like he's been 22 years old for eight years. But yeah, right. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, I thought he signed like a lifetime contract with the Phillies. So yeah, definitely an option. We'll see what happens there. Um, all right, let's let's head back to the pitching side of things in the bullpen issue that really ruffled my feathers personally, Brett, because I've got plenty of exposure to Rasiel Iglesias, the presumed clo or the closer for the for Atlanta Braves. He's going to start the season on the IL with shoulder inflammation. Are, just get to it. Are, are you taking a stab at any of the early Atlanta reliever options to grab extra saves? And how worried should I and everybody else be about Iglesias for this season? I'm not a doctor, but it really scares me when a guy who's out there throwing as hard as he can for 10 to 15 pitches every time he goes on the mound has shoulder inflammation. It really scares me. I'm, I already have shares of him, but I'm out on Rysel Iglesias for the rest of this preseason. And looking at the guys that are the heir apparent, you have AJ Minter, who is a hard throwing lefty. And then you have Joe Jimenez who the Braves acquired from the Tigers, who's a hard-throwing righty. I could totally see manager Brian Snicker going with a matchup committee-type approach. Personally, I prefer Minter, I think, to of the two, just to try to snag some saves there. One dark horse candidate that I'm personally rooting for is Nick Anderson, who the Rays 
or was with the Rays. He closed for the Rays, had a couple of great seasons with them. Had the UCL tear The basically was recommended to get Tommy John, never got the surgery and is coming back without surgery and trying to make it. And he's he put up some decent numbers in AAA. And it will be interesting to see if the Braves call him up in any sort of capacity, if he can work his way back to those late inning roles that he had with Tampa Bay a couple years ago. So it's in that order, Minter, then Jimenez, and then Nick Anderson as that $1 guy that maybe gets an opportunity here or there. Yeah, fair enough. And don't be afraid to spend the, just the $1 on somebody, even in the first week. I know you got $1,000 to spend. Doesn't mean you have to spend it all <laughs> in the first couple of weeks. So don't be afraid to throw those $1 waterfall beds in there as well. All right, Kevin, we alluded to it earlier. Minnesota, they're going to be without Alex Kirloff and Jorge Polanco to start the season. They're both expected to be placed on the IL with different injury concerns. What kind of impact are you seeing their absence being for the Minnesota lineup and playing time for their offense? I love this for my early draft season, Nick Gordon shares. I don't think there's any longer a question of playing time for him. I think Joey Gallo may get some first base reps, which brings Trevor Larnack into the play in the outfield. I think there's a whole lot that could happen here. I'm interested in all of them. These are the types of guys, if any of these are available, like Larnack and maybe Dick, Nick Gordon in some leagues, I think Joey Gallo's probably rostered in most, but he will gain first base eligibility, possibly. But I, th I think the big guys to look at adding, if available, especially in shallower leagues, are Nick Gordon. I think this solidifies his playing time. And then, uh, yeah, Larnack in the outfield. It's, Polanco might not be out long, but it's going to help. It's going to help Nick Gordon at least the first week or so of the season. I think the biggest impact is we might see Joey Gallo at first base for a little while. Yeah, just saw those random tweets and pictures of Jorge Polanco showing up with a boot. And you're like, what was it? What? Just, what? Where did that come from? All right, at least we know for pretty certain he'll, he'll start the season on the IL so we can make adjustments from there. Brett, Adam Wainwright, he's starting on the IL after pitching in the World Baseball Classic and all that, but he's not going to start for the St. Louis Cardinals to start the regular season. Who's filling in for the Cardinals rotation? And honestly, should we care? So to begin the season, it'll be Jake Woodford. He's a for former first round pick. It looks like he's going to jump into that fifth rotation spot. He's an extreme ground ball pitcher with a low K rate. He's got low velocity. He reminds me a lot of Dallas Keuchel. In 2020, Keuchel had a 199 ERA over 60 innings with a 429 X ERA. And then he got blown up in 21 and 22. Jake Woodford had a 223 ERA with a 4 X ERA in 2022. I don't want to, it's apples and oranges, of course, with two different pitchers, but it, I'm not interested in Jake Woodford based on that kind of comparison. The low velocity and the XERA scare me off quite a bit. If the Cardinals move away from Woodford, Dakota Hudson is building up his velocity in AAA to begin the season, and he could potentially make a move into the rotation in a few weeks. And he would be a guy that I would be a little bit interested in if he does break the rotation. And then the centerpiece of the Euros Arena trade, Matthew Libertor is also an option for the Cardinals. I don't know if they'll turn to him. I think he's still a little bit raw and I don't think he'd be fantasy relevant if he did get the, the opportunity. So of the three, I would maybe be interested in Hudson, but it doesn't look like he'll be the guy immediately to replace Wainwright. Yeah, listening to Nick Pollock, obviously on the Plus Pits po podcast, he's expecting it to be Jake Woodford as well. The And so maybe hoping that Liberatory will be the one that gets the opportunity in short order as well, because there's going to be another injury to this rotation. We just, we know it. Kevin, Mitch Haniger, he's not going to be ready for opening day, Gabe Kapler says, in San Francisco as he continues to deal with his own O word, his oblique issue. How does his absence impact your outlook on the San Francisco opening day outfield situation? I think it just means we're typically worried with Giants about the, all the matchups they play and the lack of plate appearances for just about anybody. I think it, it means we can be pretty comfortable that we may not necessarily want to see Jock Peterson versus lefties, but we might a little bit. Same goes with Mikey Strzemski. 
and these guys. The thing that that I am really intrigued by is Bryce Johnson still with the team. And we're here we are less than a week from opening day. He's the one, if people haven't been paying attention, that is 12 for 12 in stolen base attempts in spring training. He's still with the team. He's a switch hitter. This isn't something I'm running out and spending a lot of fab on, but I don't think anybody is. He's not somebody that's real high on my priority list, but for teams that the first thing I'm doing for fab for this week, and I've already started because I have a busy weekend coming up. So I've already been looking at all in my fab for Sunday night. Here we are recording on Friday. First thing I'm doing, especially on my early teams, is making sure I have a starting lineup, right? First of all, the further we go back, the more possible that is that we may not getting that. And then we have some obvious drops already, especially for those we early drafted on teams where I have a spot. I don't have a need, but I got a guy that there's no reason in keeping on a team like that. I might make a spec ad on Bryce Johnson here this weekend and then just see if they use him and if so how often because a guy that stole 12 bases in 14 games is going to pique our interest yeah absolutely like simply <laughs> that's a simple answer right there if you're going to put up that kind of numbers in a short period of time you got to pay attention simple as that all right brett i think this is the last thing and this just came across the news desk if you will the the figurative news desk that i'm sitting at Kenley Jansen, he left Friday's game early with a trainer, went right to the clubhouse. And if, of course, I saw the tweet go out literally about five minutes before <laughs> we all jumped in the recording studio here. And then we got a follow up from Alex Cora saying that Jansen just felt a little lightheaded. His removal was not injury related, it was just precautionary. We'll see what happens. Maybe we know a whole lot more by the time you're listening to this than we do currently while recording. But what we do know about Jansen's history is he has. Some He's had heart issues in the past, both in his time in Los Angeles and in Atlanta. He doesn't travel to Colorado for because of the thin air and the concerns around that. And obviously knew that going in, at least the Red Sox knew this going in and when to sign him without that consideration. And there's no indication that this lightheadedness is associated with that past. But of course, it's got to be on your mind when seeing this. And those who of us who have drafted Jansen as the quote, the final solid closer in drafts, like that guy at the bottom of the of that tier where this is the closer for the team, have got to be a little bit con more concerned than when they obviously pulled the trigger at, on draft day. How worried are you about the Red Sox closer here after seeing the news of Friday's game? And is it worth speculating? Again, dollar bids are totally available here on the apparent replacement or it could be replacement in Boston. In my mind, it's Chris Martin going in as the other free agent guy with some experience at the end of games. But the Boston bullpen is a lot better than it was last year. And a lot of it has to do with new faces that they brought in. Who are you looking at? I actually, so when you pinged us about the Jansen injury, I actually pulled up MLB TV and started watching it on playback. The... I don't know if you want to call it a good thing because of his injury or his <laughs> medical history with heart issues, but it didn't look like there was any ailment with his arm or back or anything like that. There was no hitch or anything in his delivery on the final pitch before he was pulled. So at least it didn't look like a physical injury. Now with his heart condition history, I'm not sure if that's a positive or a negative, but at least lends itself to the report that it was indeed lightheadedness. And this is not just Alex Cora coach speak. So that being said, if Jansen does miss time, yeah, Chris Martin was the free agent splash aside from Jansen in the bullpen. He's been really bad this spring. I know we don't necessarily tie spring training numbers directly to regular season performance. The Red Sox also have John Schreiber in their bullpen who got a couple save opportunities for them last year, who I wouldn't be surprised if they turned to him in the ninth inning instead. And a dark horse for the job would be Garrett Whitlock. He had six saves last year. They used him in a weird hybrid, long reliever, high leverage reliever type role. He's down in AAA right now in an extended spring training after his hip surgery, and they may have plans to use him in the rotation, but if Jansen misses significant time, they may need to use him in the bullpen. 
I really like his peripherals. He had a 3.45 ERA last year, but had a 3.17 XERA and a 3.20 XFIP. So I think he does have closer stuff. It's just depending on whether or not the Red Sox will want to use him there. So take a look at Chris Martin, take a look at John Schreiber, and then maybe take a look at Whitlock, who is going to start the season, it looks like, in AAA rehabbing from that injury, or from that surgery, rather. Tanner Houck and Garrett Whitlock are always the names I keep hearing. It's like, hey, these are the guys who should be closers. And I do not disagree with that whatsoever. For me, it's it gets to a point, you know what, the, like you just said, the team maybe doesn't actually want to use them. <laughs> Alex Cord doesn't want to use them in that role. We were talking about, obviously, in the offseason that Garrett Whitlock and Tanner Houck were both going to be stretched out. Garrett Whitlock will a bit more of a guarantee to be in the rotation. Obviously, Tanner Houck is actually going to be the one that gets that spot, mostly due to injury cons- concerns of other options that they had. But I get, I get to a point, even as a Red Sox fan, I was like, you know what? No, Even though I would like to see somebody like Houck or even Whitlock be the closer because it would be electric and it would be amazing. And there's stuff that obviously would play up there. I've lost faith in the fact that the Red Sox will actually make that kind of a move just because if they haven't done it by now, <laughs> they're hearing everybody talk about it. I don't think they're going to. And obviously the signing of Jan Sink solidified that as well. Yeah. Um, so you're a fan of Kyle Bloom then? I, I will stop that. Take that out of your <laughs> mouth right now. <laughs> Do not appreciate that. Okay, we'll move on. All right, that is a whole bunch of news that's to consider as you are doing your final drafts, as you are considering your fab run on Sunday night. And we are just about to hit the one hour mark here. So I think as good as time as any to take our second break. When we come back, we're going to talk to Brett a little bit about his mentality when it goes into his picking of fab considerations for his article for the 2023 season. And then we've got some actual recommendations to talk about so we'll be right back right after this all right that is going to all right and we are back of course you're still listening to on the wire i am adam howe joined by kevin hasting and this week we are joined by special guest brett ford he's going to be putting out the weekly written fab recommendation article over at pitcherlist.com for the 2023 season so before he gets a chance to actually hit publish on his first article. We got to talk to him and let you guys know exactly what's going through his head as far as his fab goes going into 2023, how it may have changed from previous years, and then just overall what you're looking for throughout the course of the season. Big picture question, Brett. How do you attack fab or how have you? And then how do you think it's going to change going into 2023 based on kind of lessons you might have learned from previous from previous seasons and what to expect going into this year? Sure. So when I'm attacking fab, tend to <laughs> the fantasy baseball community and the poker playing community seem to overlap quite a bit. So I'm going to maybe use a poker analogy and I apologize I to hit. those that don't no, play that are listening. But fine. one of the, one of the, the terms that I use is tight, but aggressive. Now try not to get loosey goosey with your bids, but be aggressive on the guys. It's like an auction. It is an auction. Get your guy the same as you would in, a, in an auction draft format. Go and get your guy or at least feel good about, I didn't leave any money on the table for prospect A or waiver wire B, whoever it was. The other thing is be informed. That's one of the things that I try my best when going into Sunday evening is to be as informed as possible. So I'm looking at our laundry list of news and notes. I'm listening to On The Wire podcast. I'm, I'm reading, whether it's picture lists, there's a whole bunch of great A lot of people that are smarter than me that are writing articles just like this. Use your resources. Twitter has lists. You can go and scalp other people's lists and just make a list of fantasy baseball fab content and educate it that way. So as far as attacking it, like I said, tight but aggressive and just be informed so you're not bidding on a guy who is losing plate appearances to trade acquisition or a prospect being brought up. Yeah, I think that's fair. Kevin, we talked about it quickly on Bench with Bubba earlier in the week, but why don't you reiterate like how you think you're going to change your attacking fab going into 2023 based on things that you might have learned from 2022 and previous seasons? Yeah, I think I'm going to continuous continue to be pretty close to what Brett said. I'd like to say con- conservatively aggressive. And what I mean by that is I'm conservative on my bid amounts, as Brett brought up, but I'm more aggressive on trying to look ahead. 
And that helps us be conservative in the bid amounts, getting out a let ahead of everybody else being on the same players. That helps a lot. I think my personal weakness in the past has been holding guys a little too long when I should be adding more players and letting some guys go, trying to get better at that. And also uh, the conditional bids. And we've all done it. I got this spot, you know, it was out for the season. So I got this spot and you put in a player and maybe even a good dozen conditional bids. And it wasn't enough that that you still have that guy that's out for the season on your roster the following week. That's just a waste of a spot. And it doesn't take very long to put a few more $1 ads on there to make sure you're getting somebody because you might need him for the weekend in in NFBC formats, right? It could come in really handy. And you got a guy that you knew was out for the season prior to the week, still sitting there on your roster, taking a spot and you could have used somebody. Yep. I think my, continuing to work at improving the same things I've been doing, but specifically dropping people earlier and more conditional bids. Yeah, that's fair. As I mentioned, my thing that I'm working on the most is especially my 12 teamers is being more aggressive with my bids in general. I always have a lot of money left over at the end of the year in my 12 teamers, even in the leagues that I have ended up doing success, I was being successful in, I still had going into the third to last week of the season, I still had over $300. So a lot of those leagues and I'm like, how am I going to spend $300 in the last three weeks of the season? So there were some funny bids out there. If you go, if you can find the history of that, of the kind of amount of money I was spending on players. But on that note, Brett, how do you like when you're making these recommendations? Obviously, we're going to talk about some players here and talk about their roster ship percentages in 12 teamers versus 15 teamers versus Yahoo, whatever. But you might be as equally interested in player A in you know main event or in TGFBI as you are in your OCs or in your listener leagues or whatever. But you don't need to spend as much money in in, in those situations because there's a whole lot of different options on the wire that are a balance or you'd be okay with. So how do you differentiate how, like how much money you're willing to spend on somebody in a 15 teamer versus a 12 teamer? If at all, I don't know if there's a mathematical formula for it. I think it's a lot about feel. I think it's a lot about knowing your league and getting a lay of the land, making sure that you're cognizant of all the news, making sure that you're going back to that, making sure that you're informed so that when you see that you're, the second place team, you're in first place, second place team has Reese Hoskins on his lineup and just had his ACL torn, but you're looking for power. When you're putting that bid in for Derek Hall, you're going to bid more, whether it's a 15 team or a 12 team doesn't matter. And there are situations like that where the league format doesn't matter. You're bidding what you're bidding to get your guy. But then there's situations like you said, where there's so many more roster options in those 12 team leagues and there are in the 15 teams and then you can get those guys for single digits double digit bids instead of having to spend up to those triple digit bids especially in the nfbc formats it's definitely something where like i said trying to be as informed as possible get the lay of the land and know your situation know what your team needs are and do your best to fill those yeah i think that is something that i struggle with less than i did in the past is the fact that I focus so much on 15 teamers and the options that I have in those leagues that when I find somebody in a 15 teamer that I really want, I then go and do my fab for a 12 teamer. I'm like, I know I want this guy in my 15 teamer. I got to put him on my list for the 12. You know what? I don't need to be connected to that player per se because of the options that you have. We, Kevin, you and I talk about this all year long and we talk about how, listen, like you can put 17 guys on your conditional bid so that you don't have to spend $50 on a guy. You can just spend $20 on all of them. You're only going to get one of them anyway. You saved yourself 30 bucks. Or if you really want to be attached to somebody, you probably need to spend more than you need to. But that's only because you're handcuffing yourself 
rather than going with what the room is giving you, if you will, for a draft room phrase. But it works the same way on in your league's waiver wire as well. Last question I'll really give both of you guys is we talk about being, Kevin, you say conservatively aggressive throughout the year. I know we work with budgets throughout the course of the year as well. I'd like to think that you're only going to go for triple digits on the right player and you want to keep a percentage of your budget each. You want to spend only a percentage percentage of your budget each week so that you have money at the end of the season to fill the gaps that you need to. But are there certain players that you're willing to go overboard on? And are you looking to do that earlier in the season? Does it matter what part of the season it is? What kind of a profile are you looking for? Are you willing to spend that triple digits on? Is it a young guy who's just getting an opportunity? Is it somebody who's showing growth in a short period of time? Somebody who's stepping into a closer role, closer hitter, pitcher, whatever. Kevin, I'll start with you on this one, but I'm gonna, we're going to ask you the same question anyway. So just think about what your answer will be anyway. But Kevin, talk about the kind of player you're willing to put in that triple digit bid for. I don't know that it's really a kind of player, but it does have to be somebody that I am confident is going to hold the role regardless of what it is that the regardless of the reason that I'm interested whatever that is it seems like to me that's going to hold for the rest of the season and then in that case yeah sure the earlier in the season that that may be taking the place the more valuable they are if you think someone we just saw Derek we talked about Derek Hall already. He may come up again in the show, and he just went from a guy we assumed was going to be the designated hitter for a couple of months to someone that, oh, now he could be the first baseman even longer. He becomes more interesting than if it was just going to be two months, and then that's prorated throughout the season. Was it going to be a guy when there's – when we're in July, then is the guy going to be there for three weeks or is he going to give us the rest of the season? I think to go big, and I do, not often, but I do. I think I, I've brought this up in, in past years. I take a couple hundred dollars off the top in a thousand dollar fab league. I have a couple hundred dollars set aside. Now, whether that's used on two or three guys to get in the 80 to a hundred dollar range, or if it's one guy that I really want, that doesn't matter. The rest of my season is I'm on a strict budget on a weekly budget with the rest of my money. And I won't pull from that. I'm not going three, four or $500 on a player, regardless of who it is. Oh man. I can't wait to see a $500 bid somewhere. <laughs> Those are always fun. And when you do put that kind of a bid in, for whatever reason, you maybe you slipped. Maybe you meant to do $50 and it ended up being $500. I don't know. It, the second place bid was going to be like $10. And <laughs> yeah. if you bid $500 on somebody and the next one bid $495, I'm okay with it. You know what? Fine. I've, I earned it. That player's never leaving my roster. <laughs> I don't care how bad they are, but I earn that. That's, that's the kind of call that you want to see. Brett, same question. Like, What kind of guy are you willing, I'll phrase it just a little bit differently. Are you willing to put in that kind of a bid on a player that would be good on any team? Or are you specifically going to be looking for players that are going to be good for your team and you're going to allow another good player to go to another team because he's not the perfect fit for your roster at that time. I think that I'm typically looking to improve my team just in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a tunnel vision on I need stolen bases. So just get stolen bases. I'll use an example from last year. I was fortunate enough to one of my good friends is a Braves fan. And he gave me a tip early in the season. He said, hey, take a look at this Strider kid. He's really good. So I, I watched him pitch a couple times when he was going still in relief role. I said, wow, he's touching 100. He's locating his fastball. I'm going to pick him up, even though he's just serving in a long reliever role. Frankly, I was hoping that the Braves would move him into their closer role when he was still in the pen. And then they moved him in the rotation and I reaped the dividends that way. So it worked out. But really, I was just trying to get the guy that had the talent and was getting the opportunity. So regardless of where he contributed, it didn't really matter that much to me, just that he had the skills and the opportunity to do it. And that combination was super sustainable, which whichever role he took. So that's the type of player I'm going for is the guy who 
talent meets opportunity, regardless of how that could affect my roster and my standings. Because in the end, that's what you're looking for is just the best guys and just hoping that kind of the stats fall where they do. Yeah, something to be said about playing defense, especially early on in the season when everybody has a bunch of money. There's something to be said about the power of the keep them honest bid, make sure that a good player doesn't go to a team, one of your opponents for a cheap amount, giving them more opportunity to help their roster moving on. But at the same time, you don't want it to be doing that to detriment of your team. Hey, I don't need this player. Like this player actually being on my roster, taking up a roster spot will actually hurt me. So you do have to consider that as you're making, as you're making your bids. Brett, besides the article that you'll be putting out on a weekly basis at Pitcher List, I want to give you an opportunity to plug anything else you might be working on. I'm going to start doing this in the, in the middle of shows because I want to make sure that all of our guests get an opportunity to let everybody know where they can find them and anything else they might be working on while we still have your, your undivided attention, listeners. So Brett, where, where can everybody find you, your work, and anything specific that you might be working on besides this week? weekly article sure i'm on twitter at fade that man a lot of takes a lot of banter but really the fantasy baseball work is all housed on pitcher list i'll be doing the fab insights article on a weekly basis published every sunday morning at 11 a.m and then i'll also be part of the batter's box team analyzing some hitter performance on i think it's going to be a once a week basis early in the week so it doesn't interfere with my fab research um but that's where I'll be on Twitter and, or I'm sorry, on, on, on picture list and then on Twitter. And while I have the opportunity, I just want to shout out my wife, Crystal behind every fantasy baseball mind. There is a very patient and forgiving wife. So thank you, Crystal, for allowing me the absurd amount of time that I put into fantasy baseball. (laughs) I, yeah, I think Kevin and I could both echo that sentiment. Absolutely. So Crystal, thank you very much and shout out to you and everybody else in your, in, in that role. All right, let's get to the heart of fab, what fab is all about. And that is where are we going to spend our money? Where are we going to spend that first thousand dollars? I'm going to recommend you don't spend it all in one place, spread it out throughout the year, but you probably, especially for all of us who did draft back in November, we've got some holes to fill. So let's talk about some options we might have out there to fill those holes. Let's, we're going to go category by category like we always do. Kevin, lead us off in the most obvious possible way in our power category. How, who are you looking at? And honestly, how much are you willing to spend in, uh, on this power bat? Yeah, this is really the only week of the year I talk about how much much at all because it's so league dependent but at least right now we're all starting with the same amount of money we're in the same spot whether it be a hundred dollar fab league thousand dollar fab league we all we have it all right now and yeah the obvious one here for me is Derek Hall for power like I said I was even drafting him in 12 team leagues as the designated hitter in my mind for Philadelphia. Now, if he gets playing time further into the season due to getting some play at first base with the Hoskins injury, he could be around a while longer. So yeah, I'm not going overboard this early in the season. I'm really not. I'm not dipping into my extra 200 bucks. So if he's the only guy I'm after, I only have one slot to spend to fill and he's at the top of my list and yeah i'm looking at about four percent on my budget i'm looking at about 40 bucks for the week maybe even a little less that's all i'm gonna spend at this time of year and i'm really if i'm drafting this weekend obviously we don't have fab this weekend for those leagues or even drafted last weekend hopefully we don't have to do anything but this is one of those instances you may have had hoskins that just happened this week and so that really has a lot to do with the roster ship percentage right now. Even main events, he's rostered in 67% of main events. I would guess the ones he's not rostered in are the ones that drafted last weekend in New York. And the, this will be 100% roster ship at the end of this weekend, my guess. And that timing has a lot to do in addition to the difference in league size. Online championships, he's only 6% rostered. I think that will go up drastically. So that was even before some of those leagues were drafted, even before we knew what was going on with Bryce Harper and now throw Hoskins on top of that as well. I think that number will go up 
quite a bit, but we've talked a lot about him. But the other guy is Mike Moustakis. Looks healthy, and it does appear he is the starting third baseman for the Colorado Rockies. Uh, it takes a lot of work to manage the Rockies players. And in fact, I'd like to point out one thing. I've been making a mistake all offseason long. In order to get every Rockies home game in NFBC formats, there is one first half of the week, and it does come up the third full week of the season where they're at home the first three games of the week, but then hit the road on Thursday. So I was wrong. You do get stuck with one road Rockies game if you're just trying to play the Rockies at home. But it's a pretty nice schedule to start the season in NFBC formats. In weekly lineup leagues, I'm not doing this because they don't play all games at home for a week till the seventh week of the season. But a lot of home games to start early in the season. Mike Moustakis appears healthy hitting extra base hits, most of them doubles, but he does have a home run, but he's 10 for 26 since they acquired him. And it appears he's their starting third baseman. Ride him, ride him while he's healthy. And that's the key, right? It's the whole, oh man, but he's never healthy, but he's healthy right now. And that's what matters. As far as how much money you're going to spend on Derek Hall, I think the really important thing to consider is I think a lot of people, because we've talked about him a lot just this episode, right? And there's obviously a lot of hype around Derek Hall because of the opportunity he's been given. You got to keep in mind, no matter what the hype is, you got to spend the money on a player and you have to consider how much they're going to play for your team. And you have to, and in Derek Hall's consideration, you also have to consider how much he's going to play for the Phillies all year long. So if you're going to, you're going to drop, 10 times as much what Kevin just suggested and go 400, go crazy because this is the kind of power that he can bring. You know what? Bryce Harper will come back. Simple. He will come back at some point this year. Reese Hoskins might not. (laughs) He probably won't, but Hall is going to lose playing time at some point this season. It might not get down to, he might not get sent back down. He might not go zero, but he's going to lose some playing time when that happens there's always a possibility that he's a bat first player. Like he could be so bad at first base where they can't play him on the field as well. And he goes back to that DH spot. There's no guarantee of playing time long-term for him. So keep that in mind when you're making these kind of bids, especially early on in the season, that would be my advice here. And if you're like, I can't believe you're only going to spend $40 on Derek Hall when you're talking about how much power and you're drafting him, this and that, you got to also- you consider what you're getting. It's also... And very rarely will we see a player, if a top prospect we didn't think was coming up and then he does and it surprises us and we get excited and we just didn't think there was room for him. And sure, a lot of people are going to go spend a lot of money. Anthony Volpe. Derek Hall, we, <laughs> that will happen. <laughs> if Derek Hall can help some of my teams, but I don't have to have Derek Hall for my team to, to be successful. That's the key. Keep that in mind. All right, Brett, any other offensive gems out there that could help you in the power category that you're willing to spend a little bit of cash on in the first week? Derek Hall is the obvious one, but I think Carlos Santana is worth a mention. He's very low owned, especially in 12 team leagues, but the the Pirates start in Cincinnati, the Great American Small Park. I'm not afraid of the front end of Cincinnati's rotation and I'm really looking to attack their bullpen as much as possible whether that's in fantasy or DFS or wherever else I can so Carlos Santana if you've lost a corner infielder and you miss out on the hall bid somebody goes bananas on the first week of fab and goes a three three digit absurd amount of money on Derek Hall and you miss him, you can get Carlos Santana for single digits maybe and plug him in for a week. And I will echo what I said about Mustakis. Like Santana is healthy now and he's obviously older. He could go down at any time, but he's healthy right now and he can help you right now. Yeah, there's a lot of different episodes that we've done in the off season where we talk about early season schedule and I definitely was picking on the Pirates hitters 
not because they're play for the Pirates, but because they'll be playing in Cincinnati <laughs> to start the season. So that's going to be a target of mine for sure. All right, let's move on to speed categories here. And Brett, I'll let you lead us off because you're going to take one of Kevin's boys that he talked about early in the season. So I'd like to hear somebody else's take on him. Why are you looking at Kyle Isbell in the Kansas City outfield? Kyle Isbell is fast. No, I, Enough said. All right, uh, moving on. Yeah, that's all we need. He attempted 15 steals in just 250 plate appearances last year. He was caught six times, so he only had nine stolen bases last year. He's a guy that I think will really benefit from the new base running rules. Larger bases, pitchers aren't allowed to pick off as often. Pitchers are rushed a little bit more with the pitch clock. I think he's a guy who can take advantage of it. You look at last year, he spent a lot of time in AAA where this rule was already implemented so it's not like this is new for him he may have a leg up on some players who have been in MLB for the past few years that this is new for them at worst he's a strong side platoon player but he could be the everyday center fielder for the Royals so he's a guy that I'm definitely interested in he's quite a bit rostered in 15 teamers but in 12 teamers including the NFBC online championships he was only six percent rostered so he's pretty widely available in 12 team leagues and somebody that I'm willing to toss two to three percent on yeah, I agree that I think Isabel could be one of the guys that benefits from the rules, especially the larger basis aspect of it. He really targeted he, when he ran last year, which was plenty, he, 15 stolen base attempts last year. He really targeted catchers who had really weaker arms, more so than he did with the with catchers with better arms. The, so I would expect him to be like, all right, now that the bases are a little bit closer, I can start targeting some mediocre or medium arms more as well. So he was also, <laughs> just to give my 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 work a little bit of a plug, if you go to Pitcher List, look for buying stolen base intent, a whole article about a lot of stat, run, base running stats that I'm going to be referencing a lot throughout the course of the season. And one of those is Bragg, which I, with a lot of help from Kyle Bland, our director of analytics over at Pitcher List, helped me put together. It kind of measures how aggressive the runner had been compared to what we would have expected him to do based on sprint speed, based on catcher pop time, based on different situations in a game. And his expected stolen base attempts was only four and a half for last year. And obviously he made 15 attempts last year with to do some quick math. That's 225% <laughs> more aggressive than he probably should have been. So this is a guy who wants to run regardless of what the situation kind of dictates. And Matheny has shown, not Matheny anymore, but he's shown that the Royals have shown that if you have the aggressiveness, it's about intent, then they're going to allow him to do that. Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong here. I know obviously there's a change in management there, but Isabel has the ability to run regardless of what our model says that he maybe he should have been running and he was successful at it. Yeah, I think he'll run when given the opportunity, assuming that the general Royals philosophy is to continue to run. Quattraro comes from the Tampa Rays system. So that is slightly concerning, but I think overall, I think the Royals are still going to be a team that, that tries to take opportunities when they believe they are there. Yeah, fair enough. And Isabel had an above average opportunity or a spot or stolen base opportunity taken rate as well. So something to keep an eye out for. Any other options in the speed category, Kevin, that you'll be looking at if you were a little low in stolen bases or run scored? But not forget, that's a speed category in your drafts. Yeah, one of these I like a lot and one of these I can't believe I actually am going to bring up. I like Bubba Thompson. I know that his OBP will be low, as in probably sub 300. But with the injury to Leody Tavares, he's the starting center fielder for the Texas Rangers. And speaking of, Brett brought up use to the stolen base rules in the minors. Speaking of being used to that, 49 out of 52 in 80 games is pretty good, I would say, playing under the new stolen base rules in AAA last season. And then came to Major League Baseball and went 18 out of 21 with the, without these rules in place here yet in 55 games. 135 games, 67 stolen bases last season combined at AAA and the Major League level. It's, he's going to steal bases. He may not get on base often, but when he does, he's going to take off. 
the one I am not as fond of, and he may get on base more often. And this is a bias I probably shouldn't have, and I don't even know where it comes from. I haven't been burned by Victor Robles but I have just not been a fan in recent years. I've never, every last couple of years, he's shown some spurts of what we thought was going to happen after the 2019 season. We were really high on Victor Robles. I'd like to bring up that he ahead of Juan Soto in the Washington system before Juan Soto came up. Robles was injured when they really needed an outfielder, and that's when Juan Soto got his shot. Robles might have got that chance ahead of Soto at that time if he hadn't been injured. But Victor Robles is only 25 years old, and he's having a really good spring. I'm not putting a ton of stock into that, but if it was anybody not named Victor Robles, Victor Robles I'd be saying we need to be keeping an eye on this. This is a post-type sleeper. So I'm forcing myself to realize that, yeah, if his name was any other name, I'd be interested here. So I should be right now as well. Yeah, 133% brag as well is very aggressive on the base pass, especially in comparison to what maybe he quote should have been doing and well above average S spot. So he's going to run. Simple as that. You just have to get on base, like you said. And if he is anywhere close to the top of the lineup, he will more than likely give himself opportunity to do the stolen bases. Whether you've been burned on Brett, if you've been burned on him in the past, I saw you raise your hands earlier, and you need to look past that and consider Victor Robles. All right, we got some opportunity to look at, and of course, we got to be looking at the schedule, and the early season schedule should have been something you were considering while drafting as well. But if it was even too early to draft, maybe it wasn't even something you could think about at the time. Here's some notes about what's happening in the first week or two. In the first week of NFBC or any weekly format, you got four game, we have four days worth of games. There are a few teams that do have four full games. Everybody is on opening day, but a whole bunch of teams have an off day on Friday. The teams that have four games in that four day period are Arizona, the White Sox, Cleveland, Colorado, even though they're on the road, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Houston, Seattle, San Diego, Miami, and the Mets. Like I said, every other team has three games. There's no two-game set, so that's nice. And everybody plays on Thursday, so if you're switching over your lineups, it doesn't really matter. You're going to get a full roster on that day anyway. Miami Marlins and the New York Mets, they start off the season with eight straight games. That's the first full week that's full, and then the first half of week two we will have a full four game set as well so consider that when making your decisions on how to maximize as many at bats or innings pitched that you can cincinnati it'll be somebody that i a team that i focus on their home games and who's going to take advantage of great american small park i'll be making note of that throughout the season they will be hosting pittsburgh in the first series of the season as well as we mentioned earlier colorado is on the road for their first seven games they won't host anyone in denver until thursday april 6th so you won't be able to take advantage of that park and as Kevin mentioned, I think the I agree. I don't think the impact of the Road Rockies is going to be as impactful. So it's still not a lineup that I'm personally scared of, but you don't get that added benefit that you'll see probably throughout the course of the season. So with all that in mind, there was one name that I'm not sure that we touched on that, Brett, you put here in our chat here. I want to make sure I get your guys' take on the opportunity that Blake Sable might have or Sable in San Francisco especially with Mitch Hanniger being on the IL and with the sneaky catcher eligibility he has everywhere, including the NFBC. Is this somebody who has put themselves into an opportunity that is worth spending a couple bucks on, especially if, let's say you're like me and you had, you picked up Shea Langliers in a bunch of places and you need somebody to fill in that second catcher spot, even for the first like, week and a half of the season right you put his name in here in the window what are your thoughts on here he's a guy that i probably wouldn't be interested in if he didn't have that catcher eligibility but with the position scarcity and the potential for some at bats being a lefty in san francisco where you're gonna platoon because it's san francisco and you're gonna platoon we know he's gonna get some at bats so i think he is a good to mediocre catcher two option in two catcher leagues. It's very. I ended up 
in those places where I got Langoliers, I always end up picking up Omar Novaez just because of the note I made earlier with the Mets. The Mets have eight games straight. And so even though catchers aren't going to play every day, unless your names are like Dalton Varsho or MJ Melendez, and they have, you're playing elsewhere. Novaez has the ability to at least rack up more plate appearances than most C2s that you're going to get. But Sable will be somebody, it's just more interesting. He's a rule five player. He's always going to be on the roster at the very least. So it's just a matter of how much playing time Gabe Kapler gives him to start off. Kevin notes on Sable that you might have that might differ. And why don't you just go right into your opportunity options besides him? No, Sable is somebody I'm definitely keeping an eye on. I'm just not ready to make that move yet. I really have no idea how San Francisco is going to use him. That's, that's simple as that. I got to watch and see what they have going on. Obviously, there is more opportunity with a couple of in- injuries they have. So definitely he's on the list. Both of my guys for opportunity are guys that we have brought up earlier in the show. So we don't have to spend a lot of time. Orlando Arcia, obviously, yeah, he is now the starting shortstop for the Atlanta Braves. We weren't necessarily planning on that. And here we are. So he is available in most places. And then Michael Massey, who Brett brought up earlier, you have brought up the Royal schedule pretty often this off season, Adam, but I don't know if we've ever spelled it out that yes, they are one of the teams that does not play on Friday, March 31st. They then play 45 in the next 47 days. They have two days off. All the way through (laughs) May 18th, starting April 1st. And Michael Massey, as Brent mentioned, is the starting second baseman. He may get spelled a day here and there by Nicky Lopez at second base. The Royals, and when they're playing that many games, he's going to need spelled a day or two there at second base. 100% rostered in main events because main events just started drafting a week or so ago. And now we know. He is the starting second baseman that, but we didn't know when a lot of these online championships and other leagues were drafted and he's only 33% rostered in online championships. He's definitely somebody I go get power speed combo, not a huge number of each. We're not talking like superstar here, but definitely double digits in both categories with the, he, he's really progressed very well through the minor leagues getting better at each stop he's his numbers improved at double a then improved at triple a and he's looked good in the limited time we've seen him in the major leagues so far and he and it doesn't mean a whole lot having a great spring but it's better than having a bad spring so i'm not putting <laughs> yeah. a whole lot of stock into the three home runs and two stolen bases Nice batting average, but it's better than if he was struggling. Yeah, and that 45 out of 47 days with the Royals having a baseball game scheduled is really enticing. Yeah, not only did he get better in different counting categories, but like this is a guy who's always held like a 300 batting average throughout his time in the minors as well. It's what everybody was expecting when he came up, obviously he finished the season at the major league level at only 243. I would totally expect that with the adjustments that he made and just learning the major league pitching and stuff like that to, for that to come back up. He definitely won't be a detriment in that category moving forward. Brett, you've got another interesting option that I think went way under the radar throughout draft season only because he didn't have a home. <laughs> and we, it was one of those guys that would come up in every podcast you listen to him. Like, why hasn't this guy been signed yet? How come nobody is taking a chance on him? He was leading off for a majority of last season for his team. Talk to me about your option here. The, the possible leadoff hitter for the Colorado Rockies. Yeah. Jerks and pro far. I think he overplayed his hand a little bit going into free agency this season. I think he uh, thought he was worth more than he and teams are willing to give him the Lamar Jackson of major league baseball, but he projects to hit lead off and play left field every day for the Colorado Rockies. Give me that player a hundred times out of a hundred. We saw guys like Connor Joe succeed there. So when you put Jerickson Profar in that position on a, oh, by the way, it's a prove it deal. So he needs to perform to get paid next year. I love targeting contract year guys. And so he's betting on himself and he's playing half his games in the best hitters park in the league. I am a hundred percent ready to 
dive right in on Profar. I've put down here that I'm willing to spend, I'm willing to overspend on Profar, 10 to 15% of my fab, because I believe he's a top 50 outfielder off the jump and he's available in 85% of 12 team NFBC leagues. Yeah. And he is, he's not, he's 30. He's exactly what the Rockies want. <laughs> so he's on the he's on the Rockies right side of 30. And so this is somebody that they're actually willing to play. I'm not going to be critical of the signing because I love it so much for fantasy, but like, <laughs> it is the Rockies are just going to be the Rockies and Rockies they're just going to continue to do Rockies things. Zach Veen is somewhere going like, why, like, why not me? But here we are. We'll get there. We'll get there. Maybe someday. All right. Let's move into pitching. We are going to skip our typical future two start section is the first week of the season. I'm not looking far enough ahead. I know a lot of all teams have set their opening day roster, opening day starter. I heard a rumor that it was actually mandated by MLB. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it's nice to know what Already, as we're recording this on Friday, a week prior to opening day, we know who's starting opening day. Congratulations, Kyle Muller being the opening day starter for the Oakland Athletics. That was amazing in a weird way. But we'll get into that next week as we start looking ahead for those opportunities. For now, let's move right into wins and strikeouts. Kevin, start us off with some pitchers you think could add to those or give you an opportunity even in the first four days of the season for those counting stats on the pitching side. Yeah, I'm going to start with Corey Kluber. 100% rostered in main events. Once again, those have been drafted very recently. Only 37% in online championships. And I doubt he would be 100% in all 15 team leagues. Those going back and being drafted prior to us knowing that he was going to be their opening day starter. The best part about this is, yeah, he gets Baltimore on opening day. Baltimore, pretty good lineup, better than we thought a couple of years ago and up and coming. And then he's going to come right back because of the off day on Friday. That means they can't flip him with someone else in the rotation, right? He's going to be the first guy up the second time through the rotation, which means then he gets the Pittsburgh Pirates. So that's a pretty good couple of, of starts to get out of the season. And then as good as Tampa is as a baseball team, we're not really scared of that lineup. And then he gets at Tampa. A really nice start to the season for Corey Kluber, who is available in a lot of spots. And then I also like for similar, kind of similar reasons, but I just think a guy that goes underappreciated, I know he's – not going to go out there and strike out a guy per inning, but Marco Gonzalez for the Seattle Mariners probably gets the Cleveland Guardians to start the season. If not, it would be the Angels, but I'm looking further ahead. Second start of the year is probably either at Cleveland or at Chicago, and then maybe Rocky Road start in there, depending on how things work out with that that starting rotation in Seattle, who everybody loves the top four guys in that most of the top four, most people, <laughs> but, uh, but Marco Gonzalez kind of gets forgot about. And what I really like about him, like I said, he's not going to strike out the world, but he throws enough innings. He's still projected for 150 strikeouts on the season. And that's the thing. Even early in the season, I, he's going to go out and give us innings. He's going to qualify for wins. Most days, he's going to qualify for a quality start for those that play in those leagues. And especially early in the year with the way teams monitor innings pitched with their starters these days, a guy like that can be very valuable. Did you give your surrogate drafter instructions to not draft Robbie Ray under no circumstances? He was kept, fortunately. Oh, all right. All right. It's not even an option. That's right. <laughs> All right, Brett, who are you looking at that could add some wins or Ks to your early season totals on the wire this this first fab run? Sure. So if I'm looking at someone who I need for week one, if my pitching staff is light, if I got a little bit unlucky with some injuries, I'm looking at targeting those Pittsburgh Pirates with Graham Ashcraft. 
Cincinnati should be their third starter, which means he should line up against the Pirates in his first start of the season on Sunday. He's a ground ball guy. He mitigates the park effect in Cincinnati, and he's been outstanding in the spring with 25 Ks in 17 innings pitched. So Ashcraft is somebody that I'm looking at, and he could be not just a streaming option, but somebody that sticks on your roster too. He's He's been really good in the spring, and he's got some nice underlying numbers that has me a little bit excited about him, even though he'll pitch half his games in course light, as they like to call it. Man, that, that ballpark was better for home runs than Coors was. I'm more curious to see what ends up happening in Toronto. I might end up talking about who's playing in Toronto this week if those new dimensions end up playing that much of a role over there as well. Yeah, and then so to move ahead in the season and look at kind of week two, week three, one of the guys that I really like moving forward is David Peterson, who I think will secure the fifth starter spot in New York for the Mets. He's got a week two matchup at Milwaukee, but then after that, he looks to match up against Miami and or Oakland. Like he could be a week three starter against Miami at home and at Oakland. There's really not much of a better two two step there. And he's pitched well in, in the spring as well. He's outperformed Tyler McGill, who he's competing with for that fifth rotation spot. So I think the Mets are leaning that way. And obviously the Mets are projected for 90 plus wins. So having a, any piece of their rotation is something that I'm interested in for sure. I just, I'm old school in the sense that I would think that the Mets losing a lefty is going to want to replace them with an, another lefty unless he pitches himself out of that opportunity. I think David Peterson has that job. I also want to quote like at Metsmerized put out a thing where they assume that whoever wins that job is might actually be the number two starter in the season. So with Scherzer starting opening day, either McGill or Peterson would actually get the number two spot. So they obviously would get Miami in this first week and then obviously be able to play then they would get either. Miami again and then at Oakland that's yeah. what I was going to bring up that if he does in fact slide into that two spot it's Miami Miami at Oakland to start the season that would be a beautiful thing <laughs> a chef's kiss all right let's get into away from the counting stats looking at our ratios because you know what you can start chipping away at ratios even before any have any ratios so something to consider Kevin, who are we looking at that can chip away? And I, I love exactly, you didn't even put a player. You just put a whole team. <laughs> and I think this is, I think this is real smart. Talk to me about who you might be looking at. Well, a couple of, because we talk about guys like this all the time. And they're guys, when we talk about conditional bids, these are guys you can make a nice long list. And I, when it comes to schedules here. Yeah, and you're adding one that, that for one of these teams. Tampa starts the season. Their first nine games are against Detroit, Washington, and Oakland. Now, Fairbanks is drafted everywhere, and even Jason Adam. I believe he is even 97% rostered in 12-team online championships. They're not available. There's still other guys in that bullpen. And with them play early in the year, guys aren't going to pitch every day. So they might not pitch back to back days the first weekend. So you got Beeks, we got Pache, we got Ryan Thompson in Tampa, any of these guys. And if I don't have enough starters to begin that first four day set of the weekend and even the first full week of the season that these nine starts come against for the Rays, I just, put a dollar on all these guys. I'll probably get one of them. I probably could get all three of them for a dollar if I wanted them all, right? Perfect guys. And Boston, very similar. Chris Martin and Schreiber were brought up earlier. And this I had them down here prior to the Jansen news. But if by Sunday, when everybody's listening to this, we get the A-OK, Jansen's OK, it was just a little bit of heat exhaustion and he'll be ready to go next weekend. Nobody's going to be picking up Chris Martin and John Schreiber either. And their first nine games of the season, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Detroit. Same situation. This, all of these guys, $1 for my, if I need a, don't want to throw a sixth or seventh starter that week. And the earlier in the year we do this, the less deep into game starters are going. So we could also grab a win here from any of these guys. If they win three days in a row, they're probably not throwing their closer back to back early in the season. This time of year, these kind of guys, 
can really add up some value. Yeah, especially since 90% of the starters out there are not 100% ready to go five, six, seven innings on a regular basis in April. So there's going to be a lot more opportunities for innings in general from these guys. Maybe they don't go like more than three times in a week, but maybe they do go an inning and a third or even two full innings instead of one inning just to eat up some of those innings that the starters are leaving on the table. Garrett Clevenger is the one that I was filling in here that I will be targeting quite a bit. I think I've actually drafted him with this in mind already rather than spending a dollar or two on him in fab, which is using my last pick on him. Or Giovanni, Javon Moran in Minnesota is also another guy that I've been pushing along. I picked him up in my last pick in Clarf with the exact similar situation. Their schedule is not as good. Nobody's schedule is as good as Tampa's is to start the season. (laughs) The Mets come close, but I do like the opportunity that some of these guys who, these relievers who can come in early and vulture a win and aren't going to hurt my ratios slash will help my ratios in most situations, especially in that first four days of the season. Like you said, you're not going to have nine starters going in those first four days unless you drafted specifically for with that in mind. And even then we see, we see Verlander going in day three. Like we, these guys don't go just because they're the number two starter. doesn't mean they pitch on the second day. Rant over. Brett, who, who else are you looking at to give you a head start in those ratio categories? Sure. This, this is a week one special. It's a guy in the Atlanta bullpen. Atlanta faces Washington in their first three games of the season. I'm hoping that maybe he can vulture a win in one of those games, and that's Colin McHugh. McHugh is pretty much universally undrafted. He's had a sub three ERA and a sub one whip in each of the past two seasons. And you look at the Atlanta rotation, right? You have Spencer Strider, right? And whoever gets the fifth starter position in Schuster or Dodd, they're all very early in their careers. They could all be on strict pitch or inning limits entering the season there's a high likelihood that one or more of them don't complete five innings. They hit that 75, 80 pitch mark before then. And in comes McHugh to save the day and get get the W. There's other long reliever options in the Atlanta bullpen. Jesse Chavez is there still somehow. But I really, I think even if he doesn't get a win or a save, I think he can absolutely boost ratios, especially in this first week. Colin Colin McHugh is the reason we have this category, right, Aaron? There you go. Right, Adam? (laughs) Him and I think it was mentioned at some point in here, but uh, oh no, he got him and Brent Suter. They were the guys that we would call up. The only reason the name rings a bell is we're doing a, a, the only draft I'm actively, no, two drafts I'm going to right now. One of them is a PLV draft. We're actually drafting based on PLV specific. It's the only category we're drafting pitchers. And it's been an interesting draft. Somebody just picked Brent Suter's changeup as their quote regression pick. So this is a pitch that he thinks is going to get worse this year. And I don't, I, I think there was a sneaky good pick on his part for that reason <laughs> as he moves to Colorado. It will not be a name that we bring up ever, never mind often, the rest of the season on this podcast. So enjoy that reference while you got it because it's not happening again. All right, let's move on to the best category here. No, not the best. Sorry. This is just the category that everybody is always chasing. That saves only one category that we care about here. Brett, I'm going to let you start us off here. Who might you be looking at that could get a save, whether it's in the first week or two or maybe throughout the course of the season? It's... I don't know if I should go first here because I feel like the better option is the one that Kevin well, picked. Well, um, you put this name on here first, I believe. and then That Kevin is fair. I did put the name first on there. Yeah. But I'm looking at Brooks Raley in the Mets bullpen. Currently, he's the only lefty in their pen, so that may be a bit of an obstacle. But he could still get saves, saves in the right situation. The... Mets open with, what is it, six games against the Marlins in the first week and a half of the season. So if Luis Arias and Jazz Chisholm are due up in the ninth in the one-two spot, and David Robertson, maybe he went the night before, maybe he didn't, but I'm still assuming that the Mets would go to their lefty out of the pen for that ninth inning. And Rayleigh's still been good against righties as well. Obviously a lefty versus lefty specialist, but definitely someone that I think can pick up saves and will be much cheaper from a fab perspective than David Robinson, David Robertson, and maybe even cheaper than Adam Adovino, who's also been mentioned for the closer spot in New York as well. 
Yeah, Adovino would be the name that I would at least throw out there since you guys picked two different Mets relievers to talk about. Adovino will definitely be bid on this week. Before we get into, Kevin, who you'd be looking at out of the Mets bullpen, it'd be, it'd be silly not to mention, obviously, you need to be throwing in. There's a whole bunch of conditional bids that you can be putting in this category. Pretty much anybody at the top end of the Atlanta bullpen, going with A.J. Minter as my personal favorite to start the season in, in there. So just know where you're going at. You don't have to spend $80 on one of these guys. Even Robertson or Rayleigh or somebody you think is going to have the Mets job for the whole season. Season or the good majority of the season, you don't have to spend that kind of money because there's a, especially in this first fat period, there's a lot of questions that have been created just in the last couple of weeks and other questions have been answered. And so you have a lot of options here, but Kevin, talk to me about why you chose David Robertson out of the Mets bullpen rather than Rayleigh or out of, you know, yeah, I went with the, what I feel is the low hanging fruit here, 100% rostered in main events. They've all taken place since the Edwin Diaz injury. So obviously that's the case, but it's a, looks like a pretty unanimous consensus with projections that Robertson is the guy. If you run, he's the 11th in saves, according to ATC projected saves right now with 26, number 11, same number of innings as Clay Holmes, same amount of saves. And more strikeouts. Just looking at it that way. Other guys in the same general area that I was looking at earlier. It was the Felix Bautista. Two more saves. One more inning. About a strikeout uh, per nine more. But really close. Kinley Jansen. Less strikeouts. Same number of innings. Two more saves. This is prior to Jansen being pulled from the his outing today. Rizel Iglesias, one more save, less innings, about the same number of strikeouts. So this is the range of what we're looking at, what David Robertson is now projected for. Right here in the mix for a top 10 closer as a projection. And this is one of those guys that I'm going to have my bids on in the 12 teamers because he's not available in 15s, at least the ones drafted recently. Fortunately, I drafted him in a couple of DCs when he was still with the Phillies possibly. And now that looks like those picks are going to turn out to be much better than it appeared they were going to be for the past couple months. But in 12 teamers, this is one of those guys I'm going to have my bids on and probably not end up with much of. I think he's going for triple digits where he's available. And I think in some of these OCs, we probably see 200 plus bids on David Robertson. Yeah, I agree. This was, we talk about all, we talk about it in the off season. Like there's always going to be these relievers on the market who end up signing somewhere. So it, where they become a closer. Robertson was one of those guys we always would mention, right? And mm -hmm. we would be like, all right, well, he's going to sign somewhere. He has as good of a chance as anybody, any other free agent. To, to sign into a closer role. So draft them in your DCs while you can, your 50s, your other draft and holds, whatever. And then obviously signing with New York, it was like, one, so of course, he signed in the one place where it's like, there's no chance of him. And then, bam, meaningless game. And oh God. <laughs> I say that with as much jest as I humanly is humanly possible in an audio format. So I apologize to anybody who took it any other way. It was just Dave Robertson, right place, right time type of thing. I agree. Sorry, Brooks Raley. Sorry, Brett. I agree. Robertson is the favorite here. And just be, due to his experience, I think really has got the stuff and he would be, he would be very good in that situation. Don't get me wrong. Um, I still agree to throw a dollar on Rayleigh. To, oh, absolutely. Until we know it's definitely worth a shot. There's no reason not that somebody, is, Paul Sports says all the time, like he might not be rostered by you, but he's going to be rostered by somebody. And so if you can stash him, hoping that it figures itself out and then you make your decision a week or two down the line and drop him back into the pool if he's not getting anything or you strike gold. Either way, it's a win-win. As long as you didn't stash too many other spots. Speaking of stashes, Oh, I'm just segueing it all over the place and calling myself out on it to ruin it every time we have our wild card section, my favorite section of the pod. It's our final section. And 
I, I, there's a caveat here that I want to make sure that everybody's aware of, especially on the NFBC. Of course, we have the rules in the NFBC where if a prospect or somebody with no major who's not on a major league roster is not has not been drafted and then dropped, you can't bid on them. The exception to that rule is week one fab, at least from my experience last year. Bobby Witt, who had not made the roster yet, could still have been drafted, picked up in the first week of fab. He actually went for definitely a few hundred dollars in one of my leagues last year before opening day rosters were set. So keep that in mind. If there is a prospect like an Anthony Volpe, who we're not going to talk about, but I want to keep throwing his name out there, <laughs> um, that, was, that went undrafted in your 12-teamer early on, Maybe one of our listener leagues, wink, wink, <laughs> just saying you can still get him now, even though he's not set on the opening day roster. For whatever reason, Jordan Walker did not get picked up, did not get drafted. I'm pretty sure he's been universally drafted throughout the all season anyway, but you can still get him now. You won't be able to get him or any of these guys after the first after the season has started and FBC updates their player pool. Without all that in mind and anything else you want to think of, Kevin, start us off here with who you might be stashing, what kind of wild card option might be available that you'd be considering if you have the bench flexibility. Yeah, Mike Soroka has actually been drafted in 75% of these main events, and it's all about one and a third inning. Just that we saw him on the mound, and he's healthy, and the Braves have told us that now the hamstring issue that has, had held him back a little longer than the comeback from multiple Achilles injuries, and he's still 25 years old. I That blew my mind. It seems like this has been going on for 8 to 10 years. No, <laughs> he's still 25 years old, but we're talking about a guy with – oh, I, I want to look real quick because I was going to say it's something like, but I think I was right, but I want to make sure I think – 37 games started, 214 innings. So about five years ago, we'd have called this a season of major league experience. Most of it came <laughs> in 2019. So it has been a while since we've seen him, since he started suffering the, those back-to-back -back Achilles injuries. Just felt so bad for the guy. But I know ERA isn't predictive of future ERA, but we're talking about a guy here, with a career ERA under three. And he's even available in 25% of 15 team leagues, and they're going to start building him up. He's available in many more 12 team leagues. And I don't think it has as much to do with the league size as it does the timing of this. Like I said, we've seen him. He's been out there on the mound. It was only an inning and a third. And then they sent him to triple A. It was like they showed him off a little bit. He's right. here. He's, we're going to be able to build him up. But he's available in two-thirds of online championships. I don't think that's going to be anywhere close to that after this week. I think he's going to be a popular pickup, even though he is a stash, even though it'll take a few weeks before we see him in Atlanta's rotation. But this is a guy that, it you know, if healthy, we're talking about easily a top 10 round draft pick if we'd seen him for a couple weeks, the end of last season and knew that he was coming into the season healthy, that kind of talent. So just, uh, he may go, ex he's one of these guys that could go for quite a bit of money in some leagues and just slip through the cracks for next to nothing in others. So definitely have a bid in on him. Like I said, I'm not going to go overboard on anybody in this first week of the season, but this may be the, the guy that I attempt to spend the most money on. This is a pitching stash, a pitcher stash, which you no, might not normally recommend. But the difference here is that once he's ready, he's in the rotation. He's Simple coming. As that. Yeah, they're not and holding he, back. And he's for getting him. innings. Yeah. You don't. You can't say that about majority of pitching stashes, whether they're prospects or injured guys or whatever. He's got a spot, and you'll be able to make a decision on him if he has any kind of setback like early. So if he gets any kind of setback during this ramp up period that he's just trying to catch up here before he gets in Atlanta, if he gets any kind of setback, you'll know you can just drop him real quick without any kind of, without batting an eye. That's always important to you, especially with these stashes. If you can make a decision, you want to be able to make the decision so that you can be more flexible with your roster spots. Brett, You've got, you, I don't know, you had this on here before. It was why I started, I gave my little spiel about the rules of NFBC and prospects. So you got a prospect on here. Talk to me about who you'd be stashing if, again, 
this really has to do with how you drafted as well. If you're like me, you have at least one league where you drafted probably like six prospects that you're stashing in the first week. You're not going after this guy because you don't have the flexibility. But if you're not like me and you have the flexibility, tell me why you might be looking at Mason Wynn of St. Louis. So I love Mason Wynn's skills, just underlying skills. They're awesome. It's really funny because as soon as the news broke about an hour before we started recording, I wanted to make a change, but I'll get to that in just a second. Mason Wynn has really good underlying skills. He's flying under the radar because A, he's in St. Louis where he's being overshadowed by Jordan Walker, and B, he's a shortstop where he's being overshadowed by Anthony Volpe. He's batted 14 for 45 this spring training with two home runs and three stolen bases in just 15 games. And the situation he's in, this might be a talent meets opportunity situation where St. Louis really needs starting pitching, especially after the Wainwright injury. So they're, they have a kind of a glut of talent in that middle infield with Nolan Gorman and Tommy Edmond. Of course, they also have a glut of talent in their outfield where Dylan Carlson or Tyler O'Neill might be expendable in a trade. Either way, if they ship out a position player to acquire a starting pitcher, Mason Wynn would be on the short list to get the call to the majors. So that's why I'm interested in him. The audible that I almost put in the notes that I didn't quite have time to make was Milwaukee Brewers outfielder Joey Weimer. I am super interested in him, especially after the Brewers announced cuts for Hira and Naquin. Weimer has 70 grade raw power. He has 70 grade speed, just a freak athlete who, if he makes the opening day roster, I'd be really interested in getting him on my fantasy teams just for, if nothing else, the sheer entertainment of watching him play. (laughs) You know what? This game is supposed to be fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I say that as much as possible. And if you want to grab a fun player just so you can root doubly for your fantasy team because you want to root for this fun player to play hard and play well, by all means, do it and then make the smart decision when you have to. That may be a difficult decision to cut them later when they're not actually playing. But in the meantime, at least you know that you have some. I've held on to Aaron Ashby for way too long <laughs> based on just because I just. I like the player and I want to make sure that I'm able to root for them even more so when they actually start performing that it's great. I keep saying it, obviously Anthony Volpe should be somebody that if he's available, he's looking a lot, he's looking, he's going to be up really early on in the season and he might be on opening day. So he'd be eligible for the fab, but he's going to get fabbed everywhere anyway. So keep an eye on how much need you might have at the shortstop position or middle infield position and how much money you might want to be willing to spend on somebody like that. If he wins that opening day job, he's not the type of player that is going to lose any playing time. The Yankees aren't going to call him up or have him start opening day and not give him every chance to succeed because they're going to want that added draft pick if he wins rookie of the year. All right, guys. Nice over two hour pod here for week one. That's a good way to start off the season. I appreciate both of you. Kevin, let's elongate it a little bit more. What kind of a final words of wisdom do you have for everybody as they consider their first week's worth of fat bids? It hasn't come up in this episode, but it's come up a lot throughout this off season. A lot of what we talk about has to do with the amount of work you're willing to put in to your fantasy teams, but that starts right now this is when it matters everybody's looking at schedules and maximizing things in september a few less but quite a few are in august a lot of people like to sit and see how things settle and see how things look until memorial day it's too late you know if that's if you want to maximize plate appearances maximize at bats maximize the quality of those at bats and plate appearances and then innings pitched on the other side it starts right now this is a great way to get start yeah 20 out of 30 teams only play two out of three days the first weekend and you're like it's only half a week it's the first weekend that's 50 percent more plate appearances possibly for some players than others it's a great week a couple of runs a stolen base that count the same now as they count in September when everybody's trying to scramble and get it from the same guys, get them now, get off to a good start and not, I I mentioned that the first thing I did to looking at my teams was the first thing I did is make sure I have a good lineup, but a starting lineup in years past, that might've been enough for me, right? This is the first fab of the season. 
unless I'm going after one of these expensive guys that I think a lot of people want and they could help all season long. A season long closer for one of the best teams in baseball is available. That's going to be expensive or who I think is going to be that closer. But the smaller stuff is if you start now, you don't need it as much later, hopefully. So don't just brush it off as this is only half a week and I have a full starting lineup. I'll look next week and see how the weekend goes. Start right now. Game one counts just as much as game 162. Yeah, absolutely. And to your point, if you're starting now, you still might need to be doing it later, but at least you put yourself in an opportunity later. Yeah, it might not have helped you're, later if you don't yeah, start exactly. now. <laughs> <laughs> you might not have been able to help yourself later on if you didn't help yourself now. So I think those are great words of wisdom to live by. And that is going to close out episode 108. I mean, once again, I want to thank Brett for joining us. Remind, I, I, I should do it in the middle, but like remind everybody where they can follow you and where anything else that you might be working on that they should be keeping an eye out for. And once again, thanks for, uh, thanks for hold, holding down the fort with us for over two hours for week one. And hopefully you got some gems on your first article that you kept close to the vest that we can hear some different recommendations in the article than you heard here. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. This has been an awesome experience for me. I told you guys before we started recording that I fanboyed a little boy a little bit when you told me that I was invited on the podcast just because I listened to this all last year and cross-referenced my stuff with Kevin's stuff and made sure that I was on track. But I can be found at Fade That Man on Twitter, and I'll be all over Pitcher List this spring and summer, hopefully giving you guys the best recommendations that I can to, to stay sharp in your leagues and get your guys on Fab. Awesome. Yeah. And of course the batter's box as well. Something I had done in the past. It's a great reference that I don't think gets referenced enough. Make sure you're checking that out on a daily basis over at pitcherlist.com for all the highlights of all the hitter highlights from the days prior to games. So I look forward to seeing your write-ups there as well, Brett. And like I said, that is going to wrap it up for episode 108 of On The Wire. Please make sure to subscribe, share, and review the podcast wherever you are listening. We'll be back every Sunday with a detailed fab breakdown throughout the 2023 season. Of course, keep a lookout for Brett's companion article over at pitcherlist.com. Comes out every Sunday afternoon as well. You could follow myself on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. Kevin is at Hasting Kevin. And of course, follow the pod at On The Wire Pod. Once again, I'd like to thank Brett Ford for joining us. You can follow him on the Twitter at Fade That Man. And after all that, I am Adam Howe. On behalf of Kevin Hasting, thanks for listening. And we bid you goodbye.